next few minutes, I wanted to give you a broad overview of the idea of age-friendly communities, and then just talk a little bit about uh, the issues around equity uh, in, uh, con in the context of age-friendly communities. Now, can I advance? There we go. Um, as was already mentioned, of course, uh, creating supportive environments was part of the uh, Ottawa Charter. It was all, also then part of the very influential Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging. And most recently, making communi uh, communities age-friendly has become part of the United Nations Decade of Healthy Aging. Um, now, when I say environment, um, I mean both the social environment, so whether that's the individual in one's life or social uh, activities, but also our home environment and then uh, the broader uh, neighborhood environment and then even the larger community environment. So it's both social and physical environment. So in 2007, uh, the World Health Organization defined an age-friendly community more specifically as one that provides supports and opportunities in the physical and social environment, as I just mentioned, to enable older adults to be safe, healthy, and participate in society. They also identified eight age-friendly domains, and to those of you working in the area of uh, determinants of health, those will not be really novel, they will not come as a surprise, but those include uh, outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, respect and social inclusion, social participation, communication and information, civic participation, so that it would include volunteering, for example, and employment, and community supports and health services. Uh, since the WHO started to promote the idea of age-friendly communities, the number of communities, and by the way, when I say communities, I don't just mean small places, I mean uh, any, any range of uh, places ranging from villages to small cities, so I'll just use the term community to simplify the language here. So since the WHO started to promote the concept, uh, the movement has grown, and Right now, there are over a thousand uh, communities in 44 countries that are part of the WHO Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. And in Canada, there are over 1,200 communities that are part of provincial age-friendly initiatives. Being part of these initiatives does not mean these communities are accredited as being age-friendly, but simply that they have committed to becoming more age-friendly. In terms of what have communities been doing, uh, so if we wonder, well, how, what kind of projects have they worked on? Well, there's a whole range and, and here just, just very uh, few examples of anything from the physical environment, so walking, skiing trails, um, to transportation, uh, enhancing transportation op options, the municipal property tax deferral was one, one project. There are a lot of intergenerational programs I have a picture there of a, uh, a program in Manitoba, the Elder Dance, which brings together older adults and school kids to dance. Check out the video. It's a fabulous program. I would love to participate in that one. We have volunteer recognition programs, and then we have a range of programs in the community supports domain, so meal programs and so on. And again, those are just a few examples. Now, I do want to address the issue around equity within the age-friendly um, community context. And let me start off with an example or a story. And this comes from a, uh, uh, interviews I did uh, in 2020 with key stakeholders in 52 communities in Manitoba to find out what's been happening there. And in one case, a stakeholder told me that they had actually built a 55 plus assisted living building in the community which was remarkable, and you'll hear more about that when uh, Suzanne talks about how difficult the housing piece is to address. Anyway, I am getting all excited because this is just fabulous. Now, fortunately, I'm probing further. And as it turns out, things did not quite turn out as they 
as intended. And what happened was that people who went into this building also had to commit to uh, getting services when needed from a private home care company. This meant there was now a disincentive for those people who probably needed it most to go into this building. So as the key informants indicated, well, it, the building was half empty. How, what a, what a shame, right? And it simply was not as successful as, as they intended. So best intentions sometimes don't work out the way they're intended. So let me just then say, talk about a little bit about the diversity among older adults. There's, there are enormous diversities. People differ in terms of their health needs, in terms of their functional abilities. There are many diverse ethnic, cultural, or racialized groups. There are diverse social groups, and I just mentioned the low-income individuals. These factors don't just influence the kind of services people can access now, but also it affects their ability to participate in consultations to make the community better. And therefore it affects how their needs will be addressed in age-friendly initiatives. The same thing applies to communities, they differ. We have uh, resource rich communities, we have resource poor communities, Geographic locations differ, so a, a, a community that's very remote is very different from one that's centrally located. Population size differs, of course, again, large cities, uh, small villages, social capital matters. Uh, some neighborhoods or communities, small villages may be very small, close-knit, there's a lot of support, others may less be less so. And there are many, of course, other characteristics. These characteristic characteristics affect how age friendly a community is to begin with, but then it also affects their ability to become more age friendly. So in terms of then how do we engage diverse groups of older adults, there are many strategies. I've just listed some of them and you have probably other examples that you could bring forward, but Engagement needs to use diff multiple approaches, different approaches to reach different groups. Service may work for some people, not others. Focus groups, walkabouts, or walking around in a neighborhood may work uh, to, to get a feel for the neighborhood or the community. Um, in terms of engaging specific groups, sometimes there's a need to go through specific organizations. I'm just thinking here of, I think, uh, people like newcomers to Canada, uh, older adults that are newcomers, uh, ethnic minorities, reaching those groups via specific organizations, ethnocultural organizations can really be beneficial. There may be a need to have personal invites, one-on-one -on -one contact with clients, again, that personal direct contact to reach those hard to reach. And then I added in partnerships with universities can actually help. Uh, the quote I have there is from a key stakeholder who commented on the fact of how helpful it was to engage students who could then walk around in the neighborhood and identify certain factors within that and limitations within the neighborhood. In terms of engaging diverse communities, I really believe that a, a top-down approach is important. In other words, the leadership from provincial government to have age-friendly initiatives, and I might add federal government to promote the concept, because otherwise certain communities will be less likely to be involved in age-friendly initiatives. And for example, small rural communities, remote communities. Um, so having that leadership from the top, I think is important. Ongoing promotion of the age-friendly co uh, concept is important. Again, I'm referring here to more that higher level provincial and federal government uh, involvement. And I think there's a need for ongoing support and that involves financial support. And I've just given here an example that came out during COVID. I hope it stays around, but it's the uh, Canada Healthy Communities Initiative uh, that private, uh, provided funding for communities for specific projects. And some of the ones that were funded in this last round focused on exactly those people that really do need it the most, like people on low income, uh, persons with disabilities, newcomers, people experiencing homelessness. 
Now, it wasn't specifically older adult focused, but it clearly will capture some of those individuals. And then there's a real need to go beyond the community. Uh, what I mean by that is broader policy changes. An individual community is unlikely to make changes in, in the big areas that involve housing, for example, transportation. So there needs to be, uh, there's a need for these policy changes, both at the provincial level, but then also at the uh, federal level in some cases. So let me leave you with some questions that simply highlight how we need to consider equity within age-friendly initiatives because equity may not actually happen on its own. So questions like, is the age-friendly initiative inclusive or are certain groups in the community excluded, particularly more vulnerable older adults? How are community assessment and planning carried out? Who is included? Who is excluded, importantly? Are there efforts made to enhance the lives of older adults, regardless of where they live, whether they live in a downtown, which may be low income, do they live in a remote community, those kinds of considerations, and why are some communities involved in age-friendly initiatives and others not? So which ones cannot participate and what does that mean then in terms of the supports they will need to also become more age-friendly? And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. And here's my name, which you didn't, well, you already knew my name, but there it is again. <laughs> but also your email. <clears throat> and so- I have my email. Know that, and that's really, um, that's really, really helpful. And we're having a bit of a chat box discussion here about um, the top-down approach, right? And, um, you know, the, the, the importance of balancing that top-down piece with the, the community leadership and the community investment and the community capacity as well, right? And, and um, I think what you're saying is that, that the top-down piece, it's not top-down imposition of a model, it's more that there needs to be leadership and willingness and investment of resources at that top level um, in order for, for these things to move forward. Is that right, Verena? Yes, and I don't mean to apply it's a top-down initiative. I mean, there needs to be, of course, the grassroots bottom understanding of the community, but also that leadership and the promotion and the uh, pushing the concept from the top down. Yeah, I don't mean to imply that this is a, a, a tyranny of approach uh, where, where, you know, somebody dictates the community. Absolutely not. Don't yeah. have me there. No, and that's, and someone just commented, you know, it's balancing the downstream, midstream and upstream, right? And it's, it, it really is, right? So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things we can tease out um, in, in thinking about what levels and, and what um, types of interventions. So that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Verena. And uh, Suzanne, 